there. Welcome to lecture 19 of Fox. And look who's here, Orange Malik. And that's because today we're going to be talking about the expected value. Perhaps the most important quantity that we like to compute when it comes to analyzing complex experiments with random complex outcomes. Okay. And the expected value in some sense continues our discussion from last lecture. So let's you know, recap. Okay. So last time. You know, we, we were analyzing you know, complex experiments with complex you know, outcomes, and then we said, well, you know, we're typically not interested in the complex outcome, we're interested in some quantity of interest, a measurement. Okay, and so we introduced this notion of a random variable which, cap which captures this intuition of a measurement. For example, if you, if you flip 20 coins, we're not interested in the exact flips, the exact outcome of the, of the 20 coins, we're just interested in the number of heads. Okay, so that's an example of a measurement. It takes on some values, in that case 0, 1, 2, up to 20. Okay, and for each possible value of this measurement, we can compute the probability, and that gives us the probability distribution fu function for that random variable. So, to summarize, a random variable captures a measurement, okay, it takes on some values, and each value has a probability. And once we have the random variable of interest and its, and its probability distribution function, we can, in some sense, you know, get rid of the complex probability space and work only with the random variable. Okay, and last time we discussed some important random variables, the Bernoulli indicator, zero or one random variable, the uniform, where all the possible values are equally likely. Now, in practice, you know, most experiments don't produce uniform outcomes, okay, outcomes, uh, values which are equally probable, but the uniform random variable is extremely powerful in computer science as, you know, a way to get algorithms to work by injecting somehow this uniform random variable, in some sense to break ties, to break conflicts. Then we talked about the binomial random variable, very important. You're trying something, you know, some fixed number of times, let's say n times, and you're interested in the number of successes. So there's some success probability, you independently try n times, how many successes will I get? Okay. And then related to that is the exponential waiting time. Okay. So here, you're trying something with some probability of success, and you will keep repeating until you succeed. Okay. And we're interested in knowing how long will it take to succeed. Okay. So that's the measurement that we made from that experiment. All right, and so both of those, the binomial, so where you try something n times and count the number of successes, and the exponential waiting time, where you try something until success, those are very commonly occurring experiments in practice. Okay? And we discussed several examples. For example, uh, a couple having kids until they have a boy, uh, sending an internet packet, um, uh, uh, sending a packet through the internet until it succeeds. Okay? Guessing you know, randomly on a 15 question multiple choice test and so on, okay? So it's important to be able to recognize these random variables. But today, we're gonna further summarize the experiment, okay? Now, we've already summarized the experiment to the quantity of interest, the thing that we measure, okay? And, you know, we have, we have reduced that thing we measure to this random variable and its probability distribution function. And now we would like to further summarize. And that further summary is, you know, think of, you know, what do we expect to happen? Okay, so now you run the experiment. Yes, you can measure the temperature. Yes, you can measure the number of heads. But what do we expect to find when we run this experiment? Okay, and that is the expected value. Okay, so it further summarizes the experiment by computing the expected you know, outcome for the random variable, for the measurement. Okay, and so we'll discuss a bunch of examples, starting with you know, flipping coins, dice, and then we'll go to these four random variables, the Bernoulli, the uniform, the binomial, and the waiting time. And finally, we will talk about conditional expectation, okay, similar to conditional probability, okay, and that'll introduce us to the law of total expectation, a very important uh, uh, law, just like the law of total probability, that allows us to compute expectations more quickly, and also it allows us to compute expectations using a build-up method. Okay, so let's talk about expected value. Let's go to the board. Let's start with a simple experiment, flip two coins, and we know the probability space. Okay, so flip two coins, okay, and so what's the probability space? Well, the sample space of possible outcomes are HH, HT, TH, TT, okay, and you know, we know the probabilities, it's this uniform probability space, you can compute it with the outcome tree, okay, so the probability for an outcome omega is one-fourth, 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 one-fourth. Okay. But now, we're not interested in you know, the specific outcome. You know, the quantity of interest for us is the number of heads. So this defines the random variable. So the random variable, which is the number of heads, number of heads, okay, is um, 
two, one, one, zero. And so what this random variable does is it converts our original probability space to something like a new probability space. It's, it's the possible outcomes for the random variable and their associated probabilities, the PDF. So uh, X of omega, so the, the possible outcomes for the measurement for the number of heads is, you know, it's either zero, one, or two. Okay, and the probabilities for each possible outcome, each possible number of heads. And we usually, you know, if we want to be very precise and, you know, explicit in, in what's the random variable, this is the probability distribution function for the random variable X. And it tells you the probability that the outcome, the measurement is, you know, little X. Little X is zero, one, two, zero, one, or two. Okay, so then the probability of zero heads is one fourth. The probability of one heads is one fourth plus one fourth, so one half. And the probability of two heads is one fourth. Okay, so this is, you know, the experiment. And this is the summary in terms of the random variable. Now, let's talk about the expected value. And the expected value has to do with, you know, repeating the experiment many, many, many times. So let us say we repeat the experiment, I don't know, let's say 12 times. Okay, and here are the outcomes we got. So we're going to get outcomes. Okay, so the outcomes we got are, you know, H, H, T, H, H, T, 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 okay, H, 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 T, uh, H, T, okay, so what's that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, let's do four more outcomes, uh, okay, H, H, uh, T, H, H, T, 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 okay, so we did this experiment 12 times in this example, but you want to think about doing it many, many, many times, and for, for me on the board, many, many, many times is 12. Okay. So now, let's uh, see what my random variable, my measurement equates to for each experiment. Okay. So um, here I have two, here I have one, one, zero, uh, zero, two, one, one, uh, two, uh, one, one, zero. Okay. So you see, each time I do the experiment, I get a measurement Okay, and so I'm getting a value for my random variable x. And now we might ask, okay, we've done this experiment many, many, many times. What's the average value for your random variable? What's the average value for your measurement that you observe? You know, if you did this experiment many, many, many times. Okay, so let's compute the average. So the average value of x. Okay, let's compute this average value. Well, what do we do? We add it all up. So 2 plus 1 plus 1, 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 0. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the 12 outcomes, okay, we add them all up and divide by the number of times we did the experiment. That's the average value of the observed, you know, number of heads, the average value of the observed measurement, the average value of x. Okay, so we have to divide by... 12. So let's add it up. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So in this example, it's uh, 12 over 12, which is 1. Okay. Okay, good. Now, um, let me show you another way to compute this average, and that's going to be key. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm not going to change the outcomes. I'm just going to reorder them so that, you know, something interesting um, pops out. Okay, so I'm going to start by, you know, seeing which, which outcomes are TT. So I have three TT. I'm just reordering the outcomes. So I have TT, uh, TT, TT. Okay, now let me put the outcomes that are TH or HT. Okay, TH, HT. So TH, HT, 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 HT. Okay, and then TH, HT, TH, HD. Okay. And then let me put the outcomes that are HH. So HH, HH, uh, HH. Okay. So HH, HH, HH. Okay. Very nice. Uh, have I changed the outcomes? No. I just reordered them. Okay. And you'll see why I reordered them in this particular way. So let me let me write down now the measurement for you know each outcome, and you will observe that the measurement is, you know, the measurement is. Um, um, Zero, zero, zero. Okay, one, 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 one. What's the measurement number of heads? Two, two, two. Anyone see how I've reordered the outcomes? Mm. 
Okay, cute, right? I just reordered the outcome so that all the outcomes that have the measurement zero came first, then all the outcomes that had the measurement one came second, and then all the outcomes that had the measurement two came third. Okay, just reordering of the outcomes. Okay, but now this allows me to, in a clear way, you know, identify three groups of outcomes, one corresponding to the measurement zero, one to the one, one set of measurements for the one, and one set of measurements for the two. Let me call the number of these measurements that appeared, you know, n sub zero. Let me call the number of these measurements that appeared n sub one, and let me call the number of measurements that appeared here n sub two. Okay. You might say, why am I doing all this? Wow. Okay. And that's because I want to show you another way to compute this average value. Okay. The average value, value of x, okay, is equal to, um, Okay. The sum of the measurements. Okay, I'm not going to change anything. It's the sum of the measurements. And here I just added them up blindly. Okay, well, I can add them up, add them up in a smart way. Okay, if I'm computing the sum, I can take the number of them that are zero and multiply by zero. So I get n zero times zero plus the number of them that are one multiplied by the value one, which is what they are. Okay, plus n one times one plus. Okay, the number of them that are two multiplied by the value two, okay? And two times two, because look, you know, this guy's contribution to the sum is n zero times the value. Okay, it'll co contribute that many zeros. This will contribute n one ones, so that's n one times two. And this will contribute n two twos, so that's n two times two. Okay, that's another way to write this uh, sum. And okay, I'm gonna divide by 12. Okay, 12, which is the total number of experiments. Let me call the total number of experiments n, okay? And I'll fill in the values right now, okay? I'll fill in the values. So this is uh, three times zero plus uh, six. So there are six, n1, okay, so n0 equals three, n1 equals six, and n2 equals three. So three times zero plus six times one plus three times two, okay, over n, which is 12. Six plus three plus three is 12. Okay, so now what do I get? I get three times zero is zero plus six plus six, so which is, 12 over 12, and no surprise, I get the same value, 1. So let me box it. Okay. So in this case, I got the value 1. And in this case, I also got the value 1. And it's no surprise, I didn't change the average. I just changed the way I approach the calculation of the average. Okay. And now, okay, this is the interesting uh, expression that I want to focus on. Because if I break it down, what I get here is I get... N0 over N, N0 over N times 0, which is the value of X that corresponds to all those outcomes, times times 0, plus N1 over N, N1 over N times 0, plus N2 over N times, oh sorry, N1 over N times 1, the value of X times 1, plus N2 over N times 2. Okay, and now, okay, while well, I only did 12 experiments, Okay. Imagine that we did many, 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 many experiments. You know, n is a million, a billion, a trillion. Okay. Well, by the frequency interpretation of probability, okay, the number of times you see zero as your measurement divided by the number of times you did the measurement is exactly what we interpret as the probability to get the measurement zero. So this here is exactly p sub x of zero. Okay. The PDF is coming in. And this here, n1 over n, is exactly p sub big X of 1. The PDF at 1. And this here is exactly p sub big X at 2. Okay. And so this is exactly equal to uh, 0 times p X of 0 plus 1 times p X of 1 plus 2 times px of 2. Okay. And now using a fancy summation notation, this is the sum over the possible values of x. Okay. We, can, we can even be explicit. It's from x equals 0 to 2 of x times p big x of x. Okay. So you know, this is equal to this. This, let me write this as, you know, it, it's 
what the frequency interpretation of probability tells us. So we expect this to be approximately equal to this as n becomes larger and larger. This is the frequency interpretation of probability. Okay. And so what I have here is now a formula which I can compute directly from this PDF table. And what does, what does this formula uh, compute? It computes what I expect to see as the average measurement if I run the experiment over and over and over many, many times. So here we have a formula for what would happen if you run the experiment many times. Okay, and let's see what this formula says. What the formula says is that, you know, um, you know this formula is equal to, you know, zero times one fourth, zero times one fourth plus one times one half, one times one half plus two times one fourth, two times one fourth. So zero plus a half plus a half, which is one. And indeed, that's what we happen to observe in this experiment, but that's because I constructed the experiment. Okay. Now, indeed, okay. Here's an experiment you can actually do at home. Okay. Run this experiment many, many, many times. Flip two coins. You can even do it on your computer. Flip two coins over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Not 12 times. Okay. Try to do it a mil well, okay, a thousand times. Okay. Do it a thousand times. Each time count the number of heads and then take the average of all the heads you've got. Okay. And see, um, um, and see what the result is. It should be very close to one. Because that's what this formula is 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 is, uh, is approximating. Okay. So summary. Okay. And now we can generalize this formula to a general PDF, and that's what the summary is going to be. So summary. Okay. So I'll now summarize even the derivation. If you have a random variable x, okay, that takes on values takes on values okay, and will ge generically represent the values by little x, little x, okay, generic value, okay, with probability px of x, so this is little x, so the, this is the pdf, pdf x. Okay, so you have a random variable x which takes on you know values. Okay. When you run an experiment okay, and you measure x you get some value. Okay. And if you run the experiment many 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 times, okay, so run the experiment many times measuring x. Okay, so you've run the experiment many times and you've measured x. Okay? So you get, you know, you get, let's say, x1, x2, x3, up to xn. You run the experiment n times. Okay, so you run the experiment n times. Now, when you compute the average, the average is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to big, to, to little n of xi divided by n. The sum from i equals one to big n of little of 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 um, the, the the measured values divided by n, and this is going to approximately. So this is the first way of computing the average. This is going to be approximately equal. The second way of computing the average, which is the sum over the possible values x of x p x of x. Okay. So this is the result of the actual experiment. So this is the result of the actual experiment. 
And this is a formula involving the PDF, which is what we derived here in this special case. Okay, now, if you do the general case, you will find, okay, so N0, so let's say X can take on the values of 0, 1, 2, 3, up to, let's say, 100. So you will have N0, N1, N2, up to N100, and you'll, you know, you'll count up the number of times you've got outcome 0, then outcome 1, and then outcome 2, and you'll have a formula like this in the general case, and you'll divide by the total N, and each of these ratios, N sub N0 over N, N1 over N, N2 over N, N3 over N, and up to N100 over N, they'll all approach the corresponding probabilities in the PDF, and then they're multiplied by the corresponding value of x. And so that's what this formula is doing. Okay. So this is a miracle. Because, you know, it would take a very long time to do a billion, a million, a trillion experiments. But computing this formula may not take a long time at all. It's just a formula that involves the PDF. And we're going to see very many examples. And so as in lieu, uh, instead of doing the experiment a billion times, we can just compute the formula and we know what the average will approximate if you were to do the experiment many times and measure the, the random variable, measure the quantity of interest, and then take the average of those. Okay, So we have a formula that we can use to sort of compute that average ahead of time. And that's a very useful Average to know. It says that if you were to repeat this experiment many times, that's what you'd see on average. It tells you in some sense what to expect from the experiment. And so we define this formula as the expected value of the random variable. So definition. Expected value. Value. Of the random variable x with PDF, with PDF, P sub X is, okay, the sum over all the possible values, okay, of the value that it could take on times the probability of taking on that value. Okay. And there are may, many, you know, ways that people refer to this you know, formula, they say it's the expectation, it's the expected value, the mean, okay, the average. Okay. And now we're going to do lots of ex examples. So I'm going to box this summary because it is very important. It's like a miracle, okay. I have a formula that I can compute, okay, which tells me if I repeat an experiment many times, on average, what will happen. It's a formula, okay. And let's start with this example. Okay. We already did it, but let's just repeat. Okay, so now let's erase all this. Okay. Examples. Okay, so first example. So for this random variable, for the number of heads when you toss a coin two times, the expected value, and so typically we write here, the expected value of x is equal to, so the expected value of x, okay, so let's box this. You know what the box says? Box says, do not erase, Malik. Okay, sometimes, you know, as some students have pointed out, even the box cannot resist the speed erase, but we will try to resist erasing that. Okay, so the expected value for this random variable is, so what you do, okay, if you want a, 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 a sort of a prescription, you know, you take the possible values, multiply by the corresponding probabilities, so multiply, 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 and then add. That's all it is. It's a formula. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so the expected value, multiply the possible values by the probabilities and add. So zero times one fourth plus one times one half plus two times one fourth which is equal to 1. So on average, when you run this experiment, you expect to see a 1 on average. Okay. Let's do the next level of complexity. Flip three coins. Flip three coins. Okay. So now the sample space is a little more complicated. It's H, 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 T, H, T, H, H, T, T, H, uh, a, uh, a, uh, T H H, sorry, 
THH, uh, THT, TTH, TTT. So that's the sample space. Now oh, it's gotten a very complicated sample space. And you can do the outcome tree and get the probabilities. Okay, it's a uniform sample space, so the probabilities are 1 8, 1 8, 1 8, 1 8, 1 8, 1 8. 1, 8, 1, 8, no surprise. And when you compute the random variable, which is the same random variable, number of heads, okay, so x of omega, so the possible values are 0, 1, 2, 3. Now, you can have 3 and the probability p sub x of x, okay, and the probability of uh, 0 is 1 8, okay, 3 8, 3 8, 1 8. So there you have the probabilities and we can ask what is the expected number of heads when you flip three coins. So the expected value of x, x is equal to, um, well, we can use the formula. We derive the formula and the formula is relatively simple. You take each possible value for x, multiply by the probabilities, okay, and add. So 0 times 1 8, 0 times 1 8, plus 1 times 3 8 plus 2 times 3 eighths, plus 3 times 1 eighth. Okay, so what is this? Let's do the addition. Okay, so you get 0, you get 3 eighths, plus 6 eighths, plus 3 eighths. Okay, which is 12 eighths, which is 1.5. What? What use is this formula? Okay, because it seems to say something absolutely bizarre. When you run this experiment and flip three coins, okay, the expected number of heads, and I'm reading this as, you know, we would, we, we, would, we, we would typically read it, the expected value for the number of heads, or sometimes we just say, the expected number of heads is 1.5. And you say, what? The expected number of heads is 1.5? That's not even possible. Okay, and so, this is where we have to come back to the definition of the expected value and what is it, what is it capturing? Okay, what it's capturing is not the typical number of heads you will see. It's, it's not even the case that the expected value is possible. It's not even, it's not, it's never possible. You, you flip three coins, I guarantee you, you will never see 1.5 heads. Okay, so in some sense, it's not what you expect to see. Okay. So it's important to sort of realize that what the expected value captures is not what you expect to see. It's not what, it's not what you will often see. It's not what you will typically see. It is the expected value, which you must think of as an average. Okay. So what this is saying is that when you, when you flip the coins many, many, many times, sometimes you'll get zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, and so on. And when you take the average of all those, it'll be 1.5. Okay. And that just means that the average of the number of heads you see, you know, is not one of the possible number of heads you will see, but that's not a big deal. I mean, if you take the average of 0 and 1, the average of 0 and 1, that's one half. There's no law that says that when you take the average of some set of numbers, that the result must be one of the number, what must be one of the numbers you are taking an average of. No. Okay. And this is a property of the average. Okay. It's, it, the average can take you outside of a set. And that's what's happening here. So it's very important. You know, in your mind, you should think of the expected value, not as a typical value, not as what you expect to see, but as what you would see if you did the experiment many times and then averaged the results. Okay. The point is, we don't want to do the experiment many times and average the result. And we don't have to because we have this very nice convenient formula that tells us what would happen if we did the experiment many times. And by many, I mean not a billion, not a trillion, uh, you know, a hundred trillion, a trillion trillion, you know, much, much more. If we did the experiment many times, we know what would happen without doing the experiment. We can take the average of the outcomes using a formula, using what's called the mathematical expectation. Okay. So, you know, let's, let me give you some exercises. Oh, let's erase this, and then I'll give you some exercises. Okay, so roll a die, and your measurement is the value of the roll, one, two, three, four, five, or six. So what's the expected value of a roll of a single die? Okay, so exercise. Expected value of the roll of a single die. 
I'll give you five seconds for the video. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I hope you 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 figured it out. You wrote down the the possible values and their probabilities, and then multiply possible values by probabilities and add it, and you should have gotten three and a half. Mm, odd. It's the same odd outcome as the expected number of heads from three coin flips. You'll never ever in your life when you roll a die get three and a half. Okay, but again, the expected value is not the value you expect. It's not the typical value. It's the value you will get on average if you rolled many, many, many times. Now try it. Roll a die a hundred times. Get all the values, average them. You should get something close to three and a half. Okay, a slightly more sort of uh, theoretical exercise. There's another formula for the expected value. So here we focused on the expected value using the PDF of the random variable. We can just use the random variable directly on the sample space. Okay, so show that Okay, and I'll box it also. So exercise, show that the expected value is also equal to the sum over the possible outcomes in your sample space okay, of the random variable evaluated at your outcome times the probability of the outcome. Okay, because remember, the random variable is a function. It takes an outcome and produces a value. And then there's the probability of the value. So this and this are very similar. Okay, here, the sum is over the, the values of the random variable. So this guy is in x of omega. So this uses the PDF for x. This uses x as a function and the probabilities for the outcomes. So you could compute the expected value from the outcome space or from the PDF. Okay? But this is just an exercise. We won't really need this much because that's one of the reasons why we got the random variable is so that we don't need to go back to the sample space, okay, uh, you know, unless we absolutely have to. Okay, let's do another example. So, the expected value here is 1.5. Okay. Let's roll a pair of dice. Now, we computed the, the, um, we computed the PDF for the sum of two dice. Okay, so sum of two dice okay and you know the possible values um so x of omega the possible values were and the probabilities associated with those so you can go and look up your notes the possible values when you 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 roll two dice and take the sum is two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven and twelve those are the possible values and let me tell you what the probabilities are Okay, so 36 possible outcomes. This is 1 over 36, 2 over 36, 3 over 36, 4 over 36, 5 over 36, 6 over 36, 7 over 36, uh, 5 over 36, 4 over 36, 3 over 36, 2 over 36, 1 over 36. So this was the PDF for the sum of a pair of dice. Okay, so if we compute the expected value, expected value is of the random variable is just, you know, you, you, you weight the possible values by the probabilities and add. So you're going to get, you know, 1 times 2, 1 times 2 plus 2 times 3, 2 times 3 plus 3 times 4 times 4 plus 4 times 5 plus 5 times 6 plus 6 times 7 plus 5 times 8, okay, plus... Uh, 4 times 9, 4 times 9, plus 3 times 10, plus 2 times 11, plus 1 times 12. Okay, divide that whole thing by 36. Okay, so that's the expected value. Okay, and now when you're going to do all this, do it in your head if you can. Okay, so you are going to get that the expected value is 7. So when you roll a pair of dice, not only is the most likely value 7, but the expected value is also 7. Okay. So in this particular case, the expected value is one of the possible values and happens to be the most likely value. But what I really did this for was to show you that when we roll one dice, the expected roll is 3.5. When we roll two dice, the expected roll is 7. And you might spot a pattern, a, a single instance of a pattern here. Hmm. So can anybody guess what would happen if we rolled three dice? Pause the video. One, two, three. Coming back. If you guess ten and a half, wow, you are very good at spotting patterns. Okay. So that's just related to something we will discuss next lecture. Okay. But I just wanted to point it out to you. Now, let's erase 
and do the expected values of our common, our, our, our famous binary random variable, the uniform, the, the binomial and the expected waiting time. Okay. And, you know, for those experiments that, you know, are common in practice and that will also illustrate some interesting cute little techniques for computing sums that are very useful to tuck into your bag and perhaps you might find use for them some other time. Okay. And then, okay, we will talk about conditional expectation. So let's erase. Speed erase, avoiding the box, the infamous box. Bam, 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 bam. Let's start with the Bernoulli and the uniform. So those are the easy cases. So the Bernoulli or binary, okay, slash binary. So the binary random variable, so, so x is equal to, you know, the possible values are zero or one and the probabilities are uh, one minus p and p. So the expected value of x, you multiply zero times one minus p, zero times one minus p, plus 1 times p, 1 times p, which is equal to, so you remember, it's that formula, it's just a formula. Okay, so this is p. Okay, very simple. Okay, so if the success probability for your Bernoulli or binomial, bi binary random variable is p, okay, then the expected value, so I'll box it uh, temporarily, expected value, value of Bernoulli, with success probability p is just p. Okay, so if you re if you flipped a coin, if you flipped a bias coin with probability p of heads, okay, and you you gave a one for each heads and a zero for each tails, then on average your score would be p. Okay, the uniform, so the uniform random variable. So this is just an exercise in computing the expected value. Once we identify the random variable and its PDF, we just compute the expected value. So our random variable, let's, let's suppose it can take on the values 1 to n. Okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4, up to n. Now this is not something you want to memorize because sometimes you might have a uniform random variable uh, you know, on 0 to n or sometimes you might have a uniform random variable which could take the values 5, 9, and 13. Uniform just means each of those possible values is equally likely. So here I have its PDF. Since it's uniform, it must be one over n, one over n, one over n, one over n, dot dot dot, one over n. Why one over n? Okay. So pause the video. Think about it for a couple of seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Now if you're coming back and you're saying, just tell me why one over n. Okay. Well, or if you said, you know, since all of them are equal and they must add up to one, they must each equal one over n. So that's why one over n. So we know, okay, that you know. These are all the possible values of x, so the sum of their probabilities must be 1. Okay. okay, but now the expected value, the expected value of x is just equal to, you, you multiply the possible values by their probabilities and add. So 1 times 1 over n, 1 times 1 over n, plus 2 times 1 over n, plus 3 times 1 over n, plus, you know, plus up to n times 1 over n. So let's factor out the 1 over n, it's 1 over n times 1 plus 2 plus 1 over n times 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n, up to n. Okay, and this sum we know. If we wanted to be fancy, we would say, you know, showing off our fanciness. This is 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i. And we know this sum. This is a common sum. It's 1 half n, n plus 1. And so the result is uh, 1 over n uh, times 1 half n, n plus 1. So the 1 over n's cancel. And so this is uh, n plus 1 over 2. Okay. So the average of a uniform random variable which takes on the values 1 to n, the expected value, is n plus 1 over 2. Okay. And, you know, you could compute this uh, sum and the average, the expected value for any uniform random variable. It's, it amounts to computing a sum. And what we see here, and even in the definition, is computing expected values means we need to be good at computing sums. Okay, so that's another benefit of having tackled sums, you know, some chapters ago. Okay, so let's erase and then do the other two big ticket random variables, the binomial and the uh, expected waiting time. Those are going to be tough. Okay, those sums are not going to be easy to do, but we'll have, we have some tricks up our sleeve. I'll show you them.
So the binomial random variable, okay. And so this is a good opportunity to review what the heck that is. Okay, so remember the binomial random variable x is the number of successes in n independent okay, trials with success probability p in each trial. Okay, so very important, very important random variable. Okay. So you're trying something and you're going to try n times. For example, you're going to randomly answer the multiple choice in the test. Don't do that. Okay, we analyzed that last time. Don't do it. Okay. So you try something some number of times, n times. Okay. And each time has a success probability p and you're interested how, how, how often, you know, how many times did I succeed? How often did I succeed? Okay. And, you know, last, and so, you know, a trial with success probability p is exactly a binary, a binary random variable. So this is exactly, okay, each of these are exactly a binary Bernoulli uh, random variable, okay, which, are, which can either equal zero if you fail or one if you succeed. So a binomial random variable is exactly the sum x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus up to xn. It's exactly the sum of n Bernoulli random variables, each with success probability p. Okay. Now, just as with the example of dice, where if you roll one die, your expected roll is three and a half. If you roll uh, <coughs> two die, it's seven. And then we guess that if you roll n, uh, three die, it's ten and a half. So you're, you're doing the sum of instead of die of, of a Bernoulli flip. And so we might, and since each of these has an expected value of p, which we just computed, you might guess that the expected value of x is equal to p plus p plus p plus plus p, which is np. You might guess that, but you're not going to allow me to get away with a guess. This is a math class, so we have to actually, we'll actually now compute that. Okay? But it's a very intuitive answer that pops out. Okay? So if you try something n times, and each time you succeed with probability p, then the expected number of successes is n times p. Wow, what an intuitive result. Okay? Well, let's actually derive it. So what's the uh, Bernoulli random variable? So the possible values are, you know, when you try uh, n times and you can either succeed zero times, one time, two times, three times, all the way up to n times. Okay. Now what's the probability of k successes? The probability, so p sub x of uh, k, let's call it k successes, is, you know, n choose k, p to the k, 1 minus p to the n minus k. So we derived this last time. It's a complicated formula. Look at that. Wow. Mm. Okay. So here the probability is n choose zero. Okay. Uh, mm, p to the zero, p to the zero, one minus p to the n. Okay. And then n choose one, p to the one, one minus p to the n minus one. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, so that's zero, that's one. Let me place this, let me re, 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 write this as one. Then two, the probability of getting two successes is n choose two, p to the two, one minus p to the n minus two. And three would be p, uh, n choose three, uh, p to the three, one minus p to the n minus three, and so on. n choose n, p to the n, one minus p to the n, uh, minus n, which is zero. It's so complicated. Okay, but you know that's what I said. Computing expected values in principle, conceptually, is very easy. You weight each possible value by its probability and add. Just get that into your heads. That's all it is. It's a very simple conceptual idea. Weight each possible value by the probability and add. Okay, that's what you should be thinking and interpret it as you know when you repeat the experiment many times on average. What's the average that you will see? Okay, so you know, sometimes you know this sum is a complicated sum. Oh well. Okay, so we wait. So we get we wait this by the probability. Wait this by the probability. Wait, wait, and then add. So we have the expected value of x is equal to n choose zero uh, zero times n choose zero p to the zero one minus p to the n plus one times n choose one, 
p to the 1, 1 minus p is the n minus 1, plus 2 times, and choose 2, p to the 2, 1 minus p to the n minus 2, plus dot 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 dot, and choose n, p to the n, 1 minus p to the n minus n. Okay, and you know, when we look at this sum, we have to compute this sum. It looks very daunting. So let's simplify a little bit. Let me call, and it's often the case that you will see this done. Let me call this guy uh, um, uh, Q. Okay, so let me call this guy Q. So this is um, that Q equals one minus P. Okay, so then the expected value of X okay, is equal to mm, zero, uh, n choose zero, p to the zero, q to the n, plus one, n choose one, p to the zero, uh, p, sorry, p to the one, q to the n minus one, plus two, n choose two, p to the two, q to the n minus two, plus that, that, plus n choose n, p to the n, q to the zero. Okay, well, technically I should put here n minus n. Okay. Now, I want, to, I want to remind you of a formula that we derived, and you know, we derived it from a counting argument, but this is a very famous formula. So it's the binomial formula. So P plus Q raised to the power N is equal to, okay, and so you know, I'll state the formula, sum from I equals zero to N, N choose I, P to the I, Q to the N minus I. And you should see a very strong resemblance between this guy, and that guy, okay? They're basically the same, okay? With I taking on the role of K and Q taking on the role of one minus P. But let me write this out. So this is equal to um, uh, N choose zero, P to the zero, Q to the N minus zero, plus N choose one, P to the one, Q to the N minus one, plus N choose two, um, <coughs> P to the 2, Q to the N minus 2 plus, plus N choose N, P to the N, Q to the N minus N. Okay. And <clears throat> well, this long complicated sum and this long complicated sum are very similar except for the 0 here times that and the 1 times this and the 2 times that and the and so on and so on. And the, you know, ah, there should have been an N times this n times this guy, okay, and n times that guy, okay, because you multiply n times this okay, when you're adding, okay. So if not for these guys, not for these guys, this whole sum would equal this whole sum, okay, okay. and that would equal this very simple expression. Okay. So now here's a trick. Whenever you see the numbers, you know, zero associated with some variable to the zero, one associated with a variable to the one, two associated with a variable squared, n associated with a variable to the n. I will remind you that the derivative with respect to p of p to the k is equal to k p to the k minus one. Okay. So, you know, if I take the derivative, so now think of q as some fixed number, and I'm letting v, p be a variable. So let's take the derivative d by dp on both sides of this equation. So on this side of this equation, so q is a fixed number, so p is the only variable here. So d by dp, okay, I'm going to get here n p plus q to the n minus 1. Okay, and that's going to equal, so the derivative with respect to with respect to p, this is this doesn't depend on p, so I get zero. Well, zero times, uh, you know, which is just a constant zero. Zero times p to the, you know, zero, zero minus one, which is you know, derivative of a constant is zero plus one. Okay, n choose one, p to the zero, q to the n minus one plus two. Okay, n choose two p to the 1, q to the n minus 2, plus dot 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 plus n, n choose n, p to the n minus 1, q to the n minus n. Okay. So where did this 1 come from? This 1 came from the derivative of p. So the derivative of p raised to the power 1, according to the standard formula you know from calculus, is 1 times p to the 0. The derivative of p squared is 2 times p to the 1. The derivative of 
p to the n is n times p to the n minus 1. So if I take the derivative of the right-hand side, it had better equal the derivative of the left-hand side. Okay. So now I'm comparing this formula to that formula, and I see that I've gotten my, okay, this term is 0, I've gotten my 1, I've gotten my 2, and so on, I've gotten my n, but now I still, now I have another problem. I didn't solve anything, it looks like, because here I had 1 times p to the 1, here I have 1 times p to the 0, here I have 2 times b squared, here I have 2 times p to the power 1, here I have n times p to the n, here I have n times p to the n minus 1, okay? But you'll observe that each term here is just missing one factor of p. So now let me multiply by p, multiply by p. So I get n p, p plus q to the n minus 1 is equal to, okay, 0 times p is 0, plus 1 times n choose 1, p to the 0 times p is p to the 1, q to the n minus 1, plus 2 n choose 2, p to the 1 times p is p squared, q to the n minus 2, plus dot 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 dot, plus n, n choose n, p to the n minus 1 times p is p to the n times q to the n minus n. And now if I compare, I see that I have exactly that expression. Okay, 0 plus 1 times n choose 1, p to the 1 times q to the n minus 1, 2 times n choose 2, p to the 2, q to the n minus 2, and so on. Really tired now, but we're done. We're done. Look, because that means that this sum is equal to this, and this sum is equal to that. So that sum must equal this. Conclusion: the expected value of x is equal to n p p plus q to the n minus one. That's a trick. Wow, it came out of nowhere. Okay, but now we know that q is one minus p. Okay, so p plus q is just one. This is just 1. Well, this is NP. Bam! And I derived it. What we thought, expect, what we guessed has been derived. Okay, so that's comforting. The guess is just a guess, but we have now derived it using the, the, the definition of the expected value. And it involved a complicated sum. Okay, a complicated sum. Well, we can do sums. We're strong. Okay, now let's take an example. Remember, we did this example, you were, you had a, a test, so example. So you have a 15 question test, 15 question test. Okay, and on each question you randomly guess if there are five answers. So you randomly guess, so randomly guess. So that means the probability to be correct is one over five. So that's the probability of success, and you have 15 trials. You have 15 trials, the probability of success on a trial is one-fifth, and you know, you want to know that's a that's a binomial random variable. You try 15 times independently, each time one-fifth success. So p is one-fifth. So n equals 15, p equals one-fifth. So the expected number of questions you get correct, expected number correct is equal to three. Okay. So now let me tell you again. Let me just re-emphasize. The expected value is a formula. It's a formula that summarizes the experiment. It's not a typical value or what you might uh, incur when you run the experiment and, and make the measurement. It's a summary of the experiment. It tells you okay, what will happen if you run the experiment many times and take the average of the outcome, the, the average of the measurements. Okay. So if you, if you do such a test many times, you know, on average, you will get three questions right. It's a summary of the experiment, and that's very important. So, we start with a complex experiment. We summarized it by looking at the quantity of interest, the measurement, okay? And that was a random variable, and it's associated PDF. And now we have further summarized the experiment by, by, by sort of condensing the entire PDF to a single value. Okay, the expected value. It's another summary of the experiment. You can think of it as what do I expect will happen, but technically it's what will happen on average. Okay, what's the average outcome? Okay, okay let's erase and do the waiting time. Bam, bam, bam. Okay, so the waiting time to success. It's very similar to the binomial where you try something n times, now you're trying with success probability p, and you keep trying until you succeed. Okay, and 
the, the quantity that we're interested in x is the number of trials till the first success. Okay. And we did the PDF of x last time, so I'll just remind you what it was. So x, the possible uh, values for the waiting time, how long you might wait, are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. And the probability to wait that long okay, is beta times 1 minus p, beta times 1 minus p squared, beta 1 minus p cubed, beta 1 minus p to the fourth, and so on. Okay, where beta is equal to p over 1 minus p. It's just a constant. Okay, so we take the expected value using the formula. So the expected waiting time. So the expected waiting time. So how long you expect to wait until you succeed is equal to the expected value of x. Okay, we wait 1 times beta 1 minus p is equal to 1 times beta 1 minus p plus 2 times beta 1 minus p squared 2 times beta 1 minus p squared plus 3 times beta 1 minus p cubed plus 4 times beta 1 minus p to the fourth plus that and, that and so on. Okay, so let's simplify this. So again, we have a sum. It's a complicated sum. We have to do this sum. Now, the result is not going to be so intuitive. It's not hard, it's not easy to guess, so we really have to rely on the mathematics. Okay, so this is equal to, I'll pull out the beta. So it's beta, okay, and times uh, uh, 1 times 1 minus p plus 2 times 1 minus p squared plus 3 times 1 minus p cubed plus 4 times 1 minus p to the fourth plus and so on. So it's an infinite sum. Okay. So it's it's almost an infinite geometric progression if not for the one two three four and so on and and you know from the from the case from the example with the binomial you might think oh should i be taking a derivative and so on and so forth so yes you can use that same derivative trick that we used for the binomial but i'll show you another trick okay so let's compute the following sum okay so in general the sum is that we're interested in is one times a plus two times a squared plus three times a cubed plus four times a to the fourth plus and so on where a in our case a is one minus p but let's just compute it for a general a which is smaller than one positive but smaller than one so that this this series converges okay and so this is one of the standard things we, we do with geometric uh, series we multiply by the common ratio so a times s is equal to uh, one times a squared plus two times a cubed plus 3 times a to the 4th, plus 4 times a to the 5, plus, and so on. And what you'll notice is that you see here I have a squared, two a squareds minus an a squared, uh, uh, and an a squared, three a squareds and two a squareds, four a, a fourths, sorry, three a cubed and two a cubed, four a fourth and three a fourth. There'll be five a fifth and four a fifth. So if I take s minus a s, so s minus a s is going to equal, well, a, okay, plus 2a squared minus 1a squared is just a squared, plus 3a cubed minus 2a cubed is just a cubed, plus 4a fourth minus 3a fourth is just a fourth, plus 5a fifth minus 4a fifth is just a to the fifth, plus da 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 da. And this is exactly the infinite geometric progression, except it doesn't start at 1, it starts at a. So this is a well-known sum. This is equal to a over 1 minus a, and this is s times 1 minus a, so if we solve for s, we get that s is equal to a over 1 minus a squared. Okay, so a useful little, you know, formula for you guys who love formulas to, to stick away and tuck it away. You might, you never know when you'll need a formula of this infinite sum. Okay, it's not quite the infinite geometric progression. It's weighted by 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay, now in our example, a is 1 minus p. So the expected value of x is equal to beta, uh, which is p over 1 minus p, so p over 1 minus p times, okay, this sum which we just computed, so we have uh, a, which is 1 minus p, divided by 1 minus a squared, so 1 minus a is just p, so divided by p squared, so this is equal to the 1 minus p is cancel, one of these guys cancel, 1 over p, wow! So the expected waiting time even though it started with a very complicated summation formula, simplified very nicely to just 1 over p. Hmm. So let's do an example. Okay. So let us say that you are having kids okay, until, you know, you have a boy. Okay. Well, if the probability of a boy or a girl is, you know, 
one half, then you will say that, you know, the chances are one half of success. And you keep doing this until you succeed. Succeed means have a boy. Okay? So the expected waiting time is one over the probability of success. One over one half. So waiting time, uh, waiting time, waiting time to boy is equal to one over P, which is one half, which is two. So you expect to have two kids. What about the waiting time to a girl? Is also one over one half, which is two. Okay. Now, supposing on Mars, uh, boys and girls are not equally likely. So girls are more likely and boys are less likely. So let's say that, you know, the chances of a girl are, are, are two thirds. Girl, probability of a girl is equal to two over three. Probability of a boy will then equal one over three. Now the waiting time for a boy is three on average. You know, you expect to wait three children to get a boy, your first boy, and the waiting time for girl is equal to one over this, which is 1.5. Okay, so you expect to have 1.5 children on Mars before you have a girl. So I don't know what it means to have 1.5 children. Can someone tell me? Da -da 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 -da. Waiting one, two, three, four, five. Yes. If what you said is no, this is not the number of children you have to have. This is the number of times on average you would wait if you did this experiment many times. So if a million people had children and, and then they look to see, you know, you know, how many children did they have till they got their first girl. Some of them would have one child. It would be a girl. Some of them would have start with a boy and then a girl. So two children and so on. Okay. And when you compute the average number of children that you need to wait in order to get a girl, it's 1.5. I don't know anyone who can have 1.5 children. Okay. So it's important to understand what the expected value means. All right. So now I'm going to tell you about the conditional expectation. So we've done uh, expected value, okay, and we have, you know, taken a look at lots of examples, okay, and just like, you know, if you're doing an experiment, okay, or, or and, and you're computing a probability, but if you get new information, you change the probability. And it's the same with expected value, because an expected value is just a summary of the experiment. So if I give you new information, you're going to update your expected value. We call that conditional expectation. Okay, and so that we'll start with an example, and then we'll define it, and we'll then that'll lead us to the law of total expectation, just like the law of total probability. And and I'll show you a nice application of the law of total probability to waiting times. Okay, let's talk about conditional expectation. So, or, how do you change your expectation? How do you update your expectation when new information arrives? And we'll work with an example. So let's look at, you know, if you pick a random person in the US, you know, what will their height be? So we're interested in the random variable height. Okay, and if you look at the PDF for the height, you know, maybe you'll get something like 55 inches. If you pick a random adult, okay, 55 inches is, let's say, the minimum. Let's say 80 inches is, let's say, the maximum. And it's going to have some distribution, okay? And you might think it's going to be some kind of um, you might think it's going to be some kind of a bell-shaped distribution. Actually, not. It's a little bit flatter than a bell-shaped distribution. Okay. And um, if we ask what's the expected value of the height, so the expected value of the height for this random experiment. So each value of the height has some probability. You take each value, weight by the probability, and compute the expected value of the heights. Okay, then we can get this kind of a, a distribution from, from various kinds of government census data and, and biological data and so on and so forth. So we can compute the expected value of the height, and it's approximately 66 and a half inches. Okay, and it's not uh, expected bell-shaped distribution that we are used to seeing when we, when we do things in practice. Okay. And why is that? It turns out okay, that it's because the population is composed of men and women. Okay. So let's now give you more information. Supposing I tell you that the random person is a man. Okay. So the random person, person is a man. Okay. What about if I told you the random person is a woman? The random person is a woman. So, 
if I tell you that the random person is, the, is a man, then, you know, the, the distribution, the PDF of the heights changes. And so you have the probability that your height equals x given man, and you'll have the probability that your height equals x given woman, or male, female. Okay. And if we look at these two PDFs, and this the, the, the overall PDF is, is in some sense a, a sum. It, it combines these two PDFs. If we look at these two PDFs, we indeed see something that looks like a bell-shaped curve. So the, for the, the PDF for women, looks something like this. Okay, so it's a bell-shaped, this red distribution that I've drawn. And the PDF for men, the distribution of men's heights. Okay, so the PDF, the probabilities for various heights for, for men is similar, but it's, it's slightly shifted to the right. So it looks very similar, but slightly shifted to the right. So you get, you know, something like that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's again another sort of bell-shaped distribution that's slightly shifted to the right. So whenever you see in practice, you know, that, you know, something is not having this bell-shaped distribution, and we will not discuss the theory of all this, but if it's not having this bell-shaped distribution, if it's a little bit flatter than a bell-shaped distribution, usually that means that there are two phenomena going on. In this case, there's the heights of the, the women and the heights of the men that are slightly offset. Okay, now, you know, we can ask, if, 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 if the random person is a man, the expected height is slightly higher. Okay, so the expected height, so the expected height, the expected height given man is slightly higher. It's approximately equal to 69 inches. Okay, so it's slightly higher than the average among all people and the expected height given you know, woman is slightly low than 66 and a half. It's approximately equal to uh, 64 inches. Okay. And so we might ask, well, you know, what's the definition of the expected height? So, so the expected value of a random variable, okay. given some information. So for, exa for example, that your outcome belongs to the set man or your outcome belongs to the set woman. So we update the the, problem, the PDF to take into account that information and then we compute the expected value in exactly the same way. So the expected value of a random variable x given some information a that the outcome is in a set a is exactly equal to the, the sum over the possible values of x okay, in uh, sorry x of omega so the possible values of big x possible values of x okay, times the value weighted by the probability of x. But that would just be the expected value. No, you don't weight by the probability of x. You weight by the probability that x equals my little x given a. So this is the conditional PDF. That's the only change. This is the, called the conditional PDF. So I'll write that down. I'll summarize that here. So the expected value of x given a is equal to the sum over the possible values x in x of omega of x times the probability distribution function for x given a. So, you know, you compute conditional probabilities and then weight the possible outcome by conditional probabilities and then sum and you get the expected value. Because when you update a probability, that's what you do. You update a probability. So you're computing the expected value with respect to the updated probabilities. So this is the conditional, what's called the conditional expectation. Okay, and I'll box that. Got lots of boxes here. Okay. Now, Okay, that's that's a definition. Here's an example. Okay, that the expected height, if you if you're talking about men, is the expectation with respect to the probabilities updated to the fact that you have new information that it's a man in the outcome, and if you do it for women, it's new information that it's a woman in the outcome. Okay, now the law of total probability allows us 
to compute expectations in a very convenient way, just like the law of total, sorry, the law of total expectation allows us to compute expectations in a convenient way, just like the law of total probability. So the law, law of total expectation. Okay, now this is very important because why? Because at the beginning of the lecture, I said expected value is very important. That's why Orange Malik showed up because, you know, now we've summarized an, an, a complex experiment into the random variable, into the random variables PDF. And now we've summarized the entire PDF using the expected value. And then the question becomes, how do we compute expected values? Well, we have a formula, but, you know, if, if we can compute expected values more easily in a more convenient way. Well, that's the total the law of total expectation. Well, that's a very important thing because expected value is very important. It tells us what to expect from an experiment on average. Okay, so the law of total expectation says that, you know, um, we can compute the expected value in a similar way by weighting conditional expectations. Can compute expected value by weighting conditional expectations in a very similar way to computing a probability by weighting you know conditional probabilities so let's look at the expected value of my random variable x okay and we just take the definition it's equal to the sum over the possible values of x times the probability of x. Okay. But now we use the law of total probability here. Okay. The law of total probability says that the probability that big X is equal to little, is e it takes on some value, okay, is equal to the probability that big X is equal to X given A times the probability of A plus the probability that big X takes on the, takes on the value X given not A times the probability of not A. Okay, that's the law of total probability. So, okay, we can expand this as the sum over the possible values X times. Now here we have the probability that big X equals X. So we can expand that using the law of total probability that gives us the probability that big X, that the probability for X given A, that's this guy, times the probability of A, Plus, time, uh, plus the probability of x given not a times the probability of not a. Okay, so I'll draw it. I'll just draw the line. Okay, I just expanded this using the law of total probability, which is equal to, okay, now I'll, I'll separate out the terms and I'll look at, this is a sum over x, so the probability of a is a constant, so this is the probability of a times the sum over x, x probability of x given a, plus, okay, using the, the addition rule, I, I, can, I, can, I can take the sum of this guy, plus the sum of that term, plus the sum over x time of x times the probability of, uh, okay, x given not a, okay, and I can pull the probability of not a outside the summation times the probability of not a, which is, this is the expected value of x given a. So this is the expected value of x given a times the probability of a plus the expected value of x given not a times the probability of o times the probability of, okay, so let me shift, I run out of room here. So this is equal to the probability, so the probability of A times the expected value of X given A plus the probability of not A times the expected value of X given not A. Okay, so let's make sure that we all agree with that. Probability of A, this is the expected value of X given a, that's the definition, okay, and then probability of not a, the expected value of x 
given not a. So the expected value of x given a is just, you know, you weight x by the probabilities of x given a. Okay, the expected value of x given not a, you weight x by the probabilities of, you weight x by the probabilities of x given not a. That's all it is. Okay. And you, you'll see the similarity between this formula for the expected value of x. You take the conditional expectations for the two cases okay, and weight by the probabilities of those two cases. For the probability that x equals little x, so the, for the PDF of x, you take the conditional probabilities in your two cases and weight by the probabilities of the two cases. It's the exactly analogous formula of the law of total probability, but now applied to expectations. So this is the law of total expectation. Okay. So I'm going to write it there, okay, and box it. So the expected value of x is equal to the expected value of x given a times the probability of a plus the expected value of x given not a times the probability of not a. Okay. Bam. This is the law of total expectation. Okay. And let us put that in a red. Okay, so that's the law of total expectation that allows us to compute an expectation using conditional expectations. Okay. And we've now just discussed conditional expectations. So let me show you the example with height. Okay. So I'll erase here, and then we'll do a bunch of other examples. So according to the law of total expectation, the expected value of height should equal the expected value of height given man times the probability of man. In other words, if you randomly picked a person, what are the chances it's a man? Plus, so this is case one. So this is the case A. Okay, plus of our expected value of height now we need to consider the case not man. Well, if it's not man, it's woman. Given times probability of woman. Okay, now I'll fill in these numbers for you. So the expected value of height um, given man is 69. Okay, the expected value of height given woman is 64. Okay, the probability of a man, okay, now that turns out to be approximately uh, 0.49. And the probability of a woman is approximately 0.51. So there are slightly more women in the U.S. than men. So 49% men, 51% women. And when you compute this times this plus that times that, indeed, you will get approximately 66 and a half inches. Law of total expectation. Let's do another example. Example. Okay. So a, a box, an opaque box, contains 10 coins. 10 coins. Okay. And the nine of them are fair. Nine fair. And one is biased. Okay. It has two heads. So you pick a coin and flip it 10 times. So pick a coin. And what do we mean by pick a coin? Randomly. And flip. 10 times. Okay. And we're interested in the number of heads. Number of heads is x. Now, you can sit down as an exercise and compute the PDF for the number of heads. So, you have to consider, you know, all the possible outcomes. You can do the outcome tree. You know, either, either you get, you know, a biased coin or you get a fair coin. So, that's the first branch in this experiment. And then you flip 10 times. So, you get a sequence of length 10. And we're interested in the number of heads. And you can do all that. Okay. But I'm going to show you how easy it is to compute the expected number of heads using the law of total expectation. So, the expected number of heads. So, the expected value of x is equal to the expected value of, of 
x given the first case so now you have to have a little bit of creativity in sort of deciding what's you know the first case and then the complement of the first case so this is like case by case analysis of expectation so what's you know a what's what's case one well we can say given that you picked a fair coin so if you times the probability that you picked a fair coin okay that's case a okay plus the expected value of x given now the complement of fair, the, the, the other case. Well, not fair means you pick the biased coin. So biased times the probability that you picked a biased. Okay, now let's fill in the numbers. So this guy here is 9 over 10 because you pick a coin randomly. So the chances you pick a fair one is 9 out of 10. It's a uniform sample space. Nine of the outcomes are fair. One of the outcome is biased. Okay, so 9 out of 10. And what's the expected value of 10 flips of a fair coin? Well, that's 10 times P, 10 times a half. Okay, so this here is 10 times 1 half. Because this is exactly a binomial. I'm doing 10 trials and each trial has a success probability 1 half, where success is defined as I got a heads. Okay, now what about here, biased? This is 1 over 10, the chances of picking the biased coin. Okay, and the expected value of the number of heads given that you picked a biased coin, well, it's 10 times P, but P is 1, because if it's biased, the probability of success is 1. So this is 10 times 1, okay, because the probability of success is a half, the probability of success is 1. So what do I get? I get 5, so I get 5 times 9 over 10, so I get 5 times 9 over 10, plus 10 times 1 over 10, 10 times 1 over 10. So this is equal to 10 times 1 over 10 is 1, and this is 4.5, 45 over 10, so 4.5 uh, 4 over 10 plus 1. So 5, uh, 45 over 10 is 4.5, so 5.5. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so if I pick from 10 coins, 9 of which are fair and 1 is biased, I pick randomly and then I flip 10 times, I will expect to get 5.5 heads. It doesn't mean that when I flip it, I'll get 5.5 heads. Sometimes when I do this experiment, I'll get zero heads, one head, two head, three head, all the way up to 10 heads. Okay. And this is if I repeated this whole experiment many, many times, on average, I will see 5.5 heads. Okay. That's what to expect when you do the experiment. That will never actually happen. Okay. So that's expectation. Now, you know, if we have time, let's do acute application of the law of total expectation. Here's a very nice application of the law of total expectation to waiting times. So remember we computed the expected waiting time using that complicated you know, sum which comes directly from the definition of the expected value. So we have this complicated sum, we computed the expected waiting time. So I'm going to show you, you know, a way of analyzing such processes that go on, can, can potentially go on forever. Okay. And we will think of the experiment as, okay, you start, okay, and you can either get a success or a failure. So if you get a success, okay, with probability P, you're done. Okay, you're done. Okay, you got one success. Okay. And, or you can fail, you can fail with probability 1 minus P. Okay. In which case, you restart. Okay. Because you try again. And so basically you're at the beginning of the experiment, except that you've used up one trial. Okay. So we're, we're, we're going to, you know, you know, we're interested in the waiting time. So we're interested in the expected waiting time. Okay, and we're going to use the law of total expectation. The law of total expectation. Okay, so let's work it out and you'll see how, you know, there's not going to be any infinite summation or anything. It's just going to drop out effortlessly. So the expected, so let x, so let x equals the waiting time. So the expected waiting time. is exactly the expected value of x, and we'll break it down into two cases. Now, you can use total expectation with more than two cases, but most commonly we break it down into two cases. So this is the expected waiting time if you succeed, okay, times the probability of success. Okay, so case one is you succeeded on your trial, okay, plus the expected waiting time given that you failed times the probability of failure. 
And why it failed? Because the, the complement of success, so the you didn't succeed is basically you failed. Okay. Now let's see if we can put numbers onto these. The probability that you succeed is p. The probability that you fail is 1 minus p. Okay. Now the expected waiting time if you succeed, well you're done. It's just one step. So this is just 1. Okay. What's the expected waiting time if you fail? This is the interesting guy. Okay. Well, if you fail, you're back to the restart. You're restarted. So you wait. So you've used up one step. So you have the wait is equal to one step plus, okay, you've used up your one step plus now you have to restart. So you expect to wait. Your expected waiting time is exactly the expected waiting time at the beginning. So one plus the expected value of x. Okay. Now, you know, you have to sit down and think about what, what, what's going on here. So if you fail, you've used up one trial and you're back to the beginning. So your expected waiting time is the one trial you've used up plus how long you expect to wait, you know, from the beginning, from, from a restart. Okay. But if you restart, how long you expect to wait is exactly the guy that we're trying to compute, the expected wait from the beginning. So this is equal to P plus 1 plus the expected value of X times 1 minus P. So let me collect terms. This is p plus 1 minus p, p plus 1 minus p, okay, plus the expected value of x times 1 minus p. Okay. So this is uh, 1 plus the expected value of x times 1 minus p. Let me take this expect. Now this is what typically happens when you consider these processes that can restart. So you have the expected value of x is, we haven't computed it. We've given an equation it must satisfy. This expected value of x must equal this, 1 plus the expected value of x times 1 minus p. If we take this to the other side, we get that the expected value of x, one of them, minus 1 minus p of them, is equal to 1. So 1 minus 1 minus p, this is just p. Okay, the 1 minus 1 cancels, and the minus times minus p is plus p. So p times the expected value of x is equal to 1. This means that the expected value of x is equal to 1 over p. Boom! We already derived this, but now it's a very simple algebra. And, you know, I went through it very slowly because probably this is the first time you've seen this. Okay? But, you know, now you can imagine that once you become an expert at using the law of total expectation, these things are going to become secondhand. You know, they're just going to be, you know, trivial for you. Okay? So get good at you know, the law of total expectation, the law of total probability, they make computing expectations and probabilities, they can make computing expectations and probabilities much easier. Okay. All right, so, you know, if you're waiting for a girl, then, and, and the probability of a girl is one half, so success is the girl, then your expected time, wait time till success is two children, just like we had before, one over p. And you might imagine, what if I'm waiting for two girls? Okay, what's my expected wait? So I get the first girl, now I'm waiting for a second girl. You might guess that it's going to be twice the expected wait for one girl. Okay. And what if I'm waiting for three girls? You might guess that it's three times the expected wait for one girl. Okay. And we, we could guess that the expected wait, expected wait to k successes is just k times the expected wait for one success. Okay. It's just it's just k times 1 over p, or k over p. That's a guess. Okay, in case any of you are wondering, well, what if I'm waiting for five girls? How many children do I need to have? Well, it sounds like you're going to have to have 10 children, or you'll expect to have 10 children. Or if you repeated that experiment many times. Now, I don't know who's going to repeat an experiment to have kids until they have five girls many times. But if you did, you would expect, on average, that 10 kids uh, are needed in order to get five uh, girls. Okay, so you have a complex experiment. You have a complex outcome. The random variable summarizes the measurement. Okay. So you summarize the measurement in a random variable and the random variable has a probability distribution function associated with it corresponding to the probabilities of each possible value for the measurement. And then we further summarized to the expected value. So we've condensed the whole experiment to one number now, which is what do you expect to happen, okay, with a grain of salt, if you repeated this experiment many, many times with respect to the quantity that you are interested in, the measurement. Okay. So 
If you repeat it many, many times and then make your measurement on average, what would your measurement be? It's the expected value. And now we did some examples of comp computing expected values. And, you know, we introduced some tools. The law of total expectation is a power tool. Okay? And expectation is so important. We're going to spend another lecture on it next time. So see you then.